Welcome to the show, folks. This is Wrestling Changed My Life. Here we go. And my dad's point was, you shouldn't do these things because you want accolades. And he's like, you shouldn't, you shouldn't be wrestling at the senior level because you want to be a world champ. He's so like, you should do it because you want to be great at wrestling. We can endure anything and adapt and pivot and change. Wrestling gave us that ability. I would say nothing in life has impacted me more than the things wrestling has taught me in terms of self-reflection, resilience. Toughness. Some guys have it, some guys don't. Adversity, 100%. How to pick myself up and be a man after I failed. And everything that has shaped my life and where I'm at today would not be there without the values and basically the, the lessons I've learned through the sport of wrestling. For me, wrestling saved my life because it, it allowed me to focus and channel my energy. We're fortunate if you wrestled because if you wrestled, natural talent helps, but it's, it's 5% of the ingredients. It pales in comparison to heart and technique and effort. It humbled me, taught me humility. Nothing can hit, humble you more than wrestling. I think it's the learning to adapt, right? You learn, you learn how to adapt, you learn how to solve problems. You know, if I look back at my time, I spent wrestling. If it gave me one thing more than anything else, it's mental toughness. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the show. This is your host, Ryan Warner. My guest today is the great Yanni D, two-time national champ for Cornell, one of my favorite wrestlers to watch, and just a great guy all around. I can't wait for you guys to listen to this episode. Fair warning, as you can imagine, there's a lot of people on the internet these days, and we had some bandwidth issues a couple times throughout the show. Not the whole conversation, um, but there was a couple glitches. And just know that I hope to have Yanni back on soon. Because there was a beginning part that we had to cut out as well due to the internet bandwidth issues. Regardless, it's a great conversation and there's a lot of good nuggets in here, folks. Fan of the week goes to my man, Christian Olenowski, Michigan State alum. That's C.J. Olenowski on the gram. Thank you for the support, my friend. I appreciate it. Hope you're doing well out in Virginia right now. Last but not least, folks, this episode is brought to you by Gabe of the Goat Part 2. That's our documentary podcast on Dan Gable covering the years 1987 through 1993. If you like the 30 for 30s by ESPN, you'll love this documentary. To listen to it, just go to episode 109 in the feed. That's Gable the Goat Part 2. And that's it, folks. Let's give it up for the great Yanni D. Peace! You must have watched hours and hours of matches on YouTube of like like the Satievs or... Um, I mean, you mentioned Batirov, and I'm trying to think of who's the the guy who uh, oh Kudakov, but see Kudakov. I know you were a big fan of him. So I mean, how much yeah. time do you think you spent just watching and visualizing it over the years? I mean, you know, when I was younger, that was just how we learned wrestling. And then you know, when I got older, it became just kind of something I did. Like in my freshman year, I remember you know I had ACL surgery after NCAs. Mm-hmm. I watched probably two or three hours a day for, you know, months. And it just, you know, got <laughs> eventually got to the point where I ran out of matches to watch. But, you know, I was always looking for something to see that was, you know, it didn't even have to be new. It just had to be better than what I was doing. Or even just, you know, if this guy does, you know, fake arm drag, single leg, and that's something that I do, why is he the best guy in the world and I'm me? You know what I mean? Just try and look at, what he does different or what what I'm missing. You know, sometimes I'll watch myself and be like, oh my gosh, I didn't realize I'm doing this. You know, I didn't realize my feet were this way or, you know, how high my stance gets, you know, whatever it is. And, you know, I, I've, I've had, you know, injuries I had to deal with. So it kind of just became this habit where whenever I had downtime or I couldn't train, I was looking for stuff I could do to get better. And that was kind of my outlook. Well, and that's where you guys kind of put together this philosophy when I say you guys you and your dad this philosophy of not doubling down on your strengths as much as looking at what other people do well and adding that to your game and I've heard you say like you're even at a young age you had this this foresight that you wanted to have upper body throws like Satiev, knee pull like Vatirov and you just went down the list and you would put all these different skills together I think it's just so unique for someone to focus on what's not working as well versus doubling down on their strengths. Is that something that's been core to you guys the whole time? 
Yeah. I mean, so the dad, my dad's, you know, I guess if you could put, so me and my brother are a little bit different just because of kind of, I guess how we retained moves, you know, but for me, you know, I, I, I pick things up really quickly. I just, as a little kid wanted to learn and hit every move that you showed me. So kind of my dad's outline for me was you should be able to wrestle anyone in any position. And, you know, maybe a guy's got an amazing right-handed single leg, so you don't let him there. But maybe also, here's, I guess, a better way to explain it. If I'm wrestling someone, and my go-to is a right-handed high crotch, and they tie up my right hand, I can't get to this high crotch, I'm kind of in trouble, right? But if I have a great high crotch single leg, underhook throw by inside leg trip, arm drag, like, you can't stop all those things. And it was just kind of where I could flow from one thing to another, where I could go single leg. All right, you stop that, I snap you down and run. You stop that, I come up to an underhook. You run square up, I go trip, wizard kick. And you had this whole system where pretty much you could do everything right, and I would still score on you because I had so many, I had so many options. I could go so deep in the chain that eventually you're going to fall behind because you're not like that. You know, it's kind of, I guess the only thing we assumed is that my opponent isn't amazing in every position also. Mm -hmm. And eventually I was going to put them somewhere where I was better. You know what I mean? And that was kind of how my wrestling developed. And then obviously over time you you end up with go-tos because you just get better in certain positions. But the goal was to just be great everywhere and have this, you know, really high level of variety. When I found it interesting that your dad had to work on patience a lot for you because you watch like Esgarov win the Olympics when he was 18 and that's your slide by and you're like, you know, I got to be ready when I'm 17 or 18. So now that we're in this kind of pandemic where you're planning on wrestling in the Olympics um, in August of the July of August of this year, how has like the patience grown on you over, I guess that's a bad way to put it, but how have you become more patient over the years? I mean, it's just kind of an, it's an, it's an understanding thing where, you know, I expect, I have expectations for myself and, you know, I, I hold myself to the highest standard you can possibly hold yourself to, but at the same time, things get in the way, you know, a global pandemic, you can't, you can't, you know, let this deter you because the Olympics are one year later. You got to look at it as it's another year to train, another year to grow, especially for someone like me who's younger, you know? So it was more of just, you got to roll with the punches kind of, you know, life isn't perfect. Life doesn't go your way. Things don't go the way you want. That's why, you know, you have a plan, but your plan is flexible. You know, I mean, you don't live and die by your system or how you want to be. Because in the end, nothing ever goes how you thought it would. If everything went how you thought it would, everyone would be the best in the world at whatever they did. (laughs) You know, so, you know, things, things happen. And you just got to be ready to roll them. But is that true, though? When you were a younger kid, you'd, you'd watch this gar off and you would you would say, man, I, I got to be ready for the Olympics when I'm 17. And then your dad would be like, slow down, slow down. I remember, uh, this is a funny story. So I watched Viktor Lebrev and Esgarov in the 2011 World Final, I think. And he was like, he had just turned 18 or he had just turned 19. And I can't remember. My dad was like, if he made the World Finals at 18, like, you can win him at 18. And I was like, you're right, you're right. <laughs> and I, uh, like, I don't know, when you're eight, you don't even know what that means. And I, my dad, you know, he understood that winning the Worlds at 18 is crazy. But if you expect to win the Worlds at 18, by the time you turn 18, you'll be really good. And that was kind of, you know, our approach where I remember turning 18 and telling my dad that story. And he was like, oh, like, just making a joke. Like, oh, I guess you suck then. <laughs> 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 you know what I mean? And it, it was like, I'm sorry. It was it was just the standard talking about how we held me. We yeah. held ourselves to this high standard where it was like you should expect the most from yourself because it's kind of like shoot for the moon land and the stars kind of mentality where mm-hmm. if you set these standards so high just in you know trying to obtain them you'll end up with these really high goals or high result really great results. Right. Whereas if your goal was state champ say my goal was state champ and I work and work and work and I win states my senior year of high school. And this is what I, you know, and I could have had the success that I have or could have in the future. It'd be disappointing to know that that and never been able to reach that because, you know, you didn't hold yourself to that standard. So I try to hold myself to this really high standard just to, takes me. 
yeah, the potential, each person's potential, who knows how far it can go, right? And how far you could actually tap into that. Obviously, you're tapping it to the extreme every day. And I love that you have a daily focus um, versus big outcome goals. And I'm sure you have the outcome goals too, but you put yourself, you hold yourself to a high standard on a daily basis. So what does a day in the life look like for you? Like, for example, what time do you get up? What's the first thing you're thinking? What's your training in and your diet throughout the day? Like this year, I I uh I took an Olympic record, so I wasn't in class. We even like today, but like I'll during this pandemic. It. Like, yeah. what's what's it look like now? Like I get, like I'm like I'm up sometime between eight and eight and nine for nine for. And I get up, make breakfast, kind of. You know, usually we'll wrestle in the afternoon, so so I go on. My dad has like all of the NCAA that that he's ever had on TV record. Or just go on. Talk about what I'm working on that day. We might talk about who's coming and you know who I'm going to grab. I'm going to grab, you know, kill some more time. Get have lunch, lunch, you know, in the morning, in that morning afternoon phase. You know, relax when relax when I go outside and do some stuff around the house or just like play basketball in the backyard. You go wrestle, and right now, like what I'm doing is a lot of a lot of skill stuff. Just getting in there and you know, grabbing my brother and helping him out with stuff, or you know, my dad's got me. Got me working on ankle pick stuff, or you know, shots from space, or you know, heavy tie stuff, you know, whatever it is, and it's very deliberate, especially right now when you know you don't know when the next time you're wrestling is. It's very much all right. Work on this. You know, spend an hour doing this. Spend an hour doing nothing but this when he's trying to stop you from doing it. Also, and you know, you go back, you finish, you watch a little more wrestling, wrestling, and kind of hang out with your brothers and go to bed and repeat, and just a lot of. I guess it's a lot of, you know, it's not like I'm doing a ton, doing a ton of work. Day right now, Max. It's just a lot of thinking about it, you know what I mean? And mm-hmm. kind of being philosophical, you know, what, what do I want my wrestling to look like? You know, if I'm wrestling in the world finals, what does the first minute look like? What does the last minute look like? You know, I mean, it's just little stuff like that. You know, what, if I were to make a scouting report on myself, what would you say? That kind of stuff. Is it something you do where you'll go to your room and, and sit by yourself and like close your eyes and meditate, or does it just happen throughout the day? It's just kind of organic. You know, I might literally walk into the same room as my dad, and he's like, you know, I was thinking about for your high cross, you should do this. And, you know, you talk about it for 20 minutes, 30 minutes, you walk away. You might come back in the room and be like, oh, you know, I was thinking about this for <laughs> single, like, and talk about it some more. And it just kind of, it just happens in conversation because growing up, you know, that was what we talked about. We didn't really talk about much else. So it just kind of became a, a habit to, if you're talking to my dad, you know, you probably wrestling came up at some point. <laughs> dude, your mom must be a saint over there, dude. Yeah. You know, she's invested. She cares a lot about our results. And, you know, sometimes it's tough. For, it was tough for her, especially growing up, because she didn't really get it. You know what I mean? She had never, she had never been around wrestling. She didn't know what wrestling was like. She didn't know wrestling people. So... It was definitely an adjustment for her, you know. It's 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 really it's very foreign. It's not football, you know what I mean? Yeah. So there there is a curve for her, but she's all she's all in now. <laughs> well, dude, we've been talking a lot about your training and, and the success you had at an early age. I thought this story was fascinating. You, I think it must have been your junior or sophomore year. You lost a veto at the Flow Nationals, and after that, you came back and you're like. This is ridiculous. I got to start training at the RTC. You start going to Cornell to work out and you were going with Nishan and you thought he was going live the whole time and your pops looks over at him and it's like, all right, let's go live. And you're like, I thought we were going live. Dude, what, uh, what all transpired there? So I remember, so I lost to, to Dayton. Me, so Vito was that way below. I had lost to Dayton fixing the finals of flow. And I remember, you know, my dad and I finding... I can't remember if it was Coach Cole or Mike, but they both were there. And I was like, hey, like, I can't be losing other high school guys. So when can I start coming? And they're like, you can come tomorrow if you want. <laughs> so, you know, literally the following week, I, I make my way up to Ithaca with my dad. And I'm at the RTC. And it became this thing I did once a week. You know, on Wednesdays, I would go and wrestle with Mike or whatever college guy they put me with. And I remember one day I would wrestle with Nason. And he had just all American at 125. I, I would wrestle with 120. You know that whole season, so I'm like, all right, I'm, I'm gonna be able to wrestle with him, not understanding this maturity difference. And 
you know, one of the big things that they do at Cornell, you know, on these like free drill days where there's not a lot of instruction is you start at a really light pace and it just continuously escalates until it's, you know, a fraction from being live. Mm -hmm. And at some point in there, I just started wrestling live, but Nason was still like building to it. I didn't know that. So <laughs> we're like scrapping. I'm taking him down. He's taking me down. I'm, you know, and we're just going back and forth, back and forth. And I'm like, man, you know, I'm doing good. And uh, my dad's like, all right, you know, like, you know, you two, like, take a break and then let's wrestle some live. And I was like, looking at Nate, I'm like, what do you mean I'm, I'm wrestling live? And he's like, oh, look, and he, like, his eyes get all big and he looks at my dad. He's like, I'm not going to do that to him. And my dad's like, <laughs> And I'm like, what do you mean? Like, let's let's go. Like, what do you mean? I'm not gonna let not let you do it to me. Like, get out of here. And I'm like, let's go. All right. So I get in our stance, and I'm like, this dude, this dude is not that much better than me. Oh, he was way better than me. <laughs> <laughs> He's double legging me and pulling my shirt over my face as I'm getting up, scooping my feet out, double legging me again into the wall. You know what I mean? And just like as much as he was beating me with wrestling, he was just physically slamming me all over the place. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then you know I might take him down, and then get up, get double leg turned upside down, and get up, you know, ankle picked off the go, and then get a takedown, and then slam down my head again, slam my head two more times, take him down. You know what I mean? For real, take him down though. You think you really took him down, or did he let you have him? He might have let me in on his leg, and then you know I kind of put him in a position where he was like, oh, okay, hey, check it out. You know, but. It was a lot of him slamming me on my head and me just kind of like diving at his feet and getting taken down. <laughs> and I remember ending and I was, I was so mad. The, the car rides home from Ithaca were always so funny because it was just two hours of my dad telling me what I did wrong and what I need to fix and me just being so frustrated. Because I just didn't get, I didn't get how big of a jump it is from high school to college, you know what I mean? Right. I would come and wrestle with Mike on a day and I'd be sitting in the car and I, I'd be on the way home. This is like my junior high school too, when I was a little bit bigger. I'd be like, man, like I suck. I'm, I'm, I suck. He's like, you know, I'm so far from where I want to be. I suck. I suck. I suck. My dad's like, relax. Like you're just being a baby about it. Like you'll see when you get older. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it kind of, for that first year of college showed me a lot because you don't realize how much, you know, your body changes in that year. You know, you're, you're running for the first time, lifting for the first time, you're wrestling men every day. And it, it changes you a lot. And I didn't, I didn't understand that. And I, I needed that, you know, I mean, that was kind of the element of my game that I feel like was missing the most was that my physical maturity. So are you doing any running lifting now? Or is that mostly in season division one season type stuff? You know, I, I still lift pretty regularly. You know, I think it's important to stay strong. I don't run as much, you know, I feel like that's something you do in the preseason to build a conditioning base. And then, you know, you just stay in shape. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like I wrestle and I just make sure I stay in shape. You know, I drill hard for 10 minutes a day to keep it up, make sure mm -hmm. I'm still good. And then, you know, you stay in good shape and then you hit the preseason and you hit another spike. You know what I mean? Right. And, you know, I, I try to regularly lift. I think that you can lose strength pretty quickly. And lifting isn't the most abusive thing. You know what I mean? It's not super hard on your joints as long as you have a break before you wrestle again. Right. So I, I try to lift regularly. Yeah. No, I just thought that was uh, interesting because, I mean, you were the elite of the elite in high school right up there with, with some of the names we know now. And even then, there's a big jump, you know, even from college. And, I mean, that was the year – I think that was the year Nashawn beat McDonough. Um, so he was right there with – with the top guys. And so that's a pretty good test for you, even though he's quite a bit bigger, but I just thought that was interesting that there's still a little bit of a gap, even from high school to college. Yeah. I mean, so by, by my senior year, I think I would have been competitive with those guys, but I mean, you don't know. I remember this is a funny story. When I was a senior in high school, it was May of my senior year. And uh, we had, like, a match day at Cornell, but Lock Haven was there. And they were like, come, it's an RTC workout. I was like, okay. And uh, I wrestled Ronnie Perry. And then, you know, that following year, he made the NCAA finals. But he beat me in a match, like, I don't know, it like, by two or three points, whatever it was. And I remember coming back and just being like, oh, my God. Like, what? Like, I 
I'm there. You know what I mean? I'm like, this guy's a 49 pounder. I wrestled 145. Like, he's about my size. And I remember my dad, and he was like, he sucks. Like, busting my, like, not totally joking, but a little bit joking, but mostly just like, dude, what? Like, and I remember, you know, then he had that great season, made the national finals. And I remember looking at my dad being like, oh, <laughs> what's up? <laughs> but you had been out all you of know, your senior but, year for injuries, though, too, right? Like, you didn't even wrestle your senior yeah. year in high school. Yeah, so I broke my elbow in December. Had surgery on it. Had surgery on the other one in January. I wrestled in the Journeyman Freestyle Classic and then the U.S. Open. I had more problems with my elbow. You know, I almost, I almost tore my tricep tendon. Uh, I was kind of hanging tight, hanging by threads. So I took more time off. I got sick, all this stuff. But you know, right around end of May, early June, I kind of was able to wrestle again. Came there, got my head kicked in by Ronnie Perry, and then. You know, hit the preseason in August, and that was when I got a huge jump. Was that preseason my yeah. freshman year? Dude, that was such a fun season. I was I was going back and reliving some of those matches. It's it's a shame you can't find you versus um, Hyle online anywhere. The full match, at least, um, unless you have it somewhere. But dude, I, w- I was uh, just watching the highlight clip that was put together. I had forgotten that you tore your ACL in that match. I don't know how, but is it true you didn't know about it the whole tournament? So. Mm-hmm. So, first minute, we get in a scramble, and I look to slip my knee out like a rubber knee. And, like, it gets stuck on his head. So, usually, when I hit that, I try to keep my knee on the back of your neck because it keeps my leg in place, kind of. You know what I mean? I just turn my whole leg. He, like, slipped his head out and drove it into my knee to, like, lock my knee in while I was turning my body and just ripped it that way. And I was like, oh. And, like, I didn't know what I did. I just got up, and the first step I took with my right leg, my knee buckled, and I was like, oh, well, that's definitely a problem. But that's that's for the later. You know, I get through that match, and I remember running up to Mike, and it was Mike in the middle, Coach Cole on my left, and Scarlett on my right. And I jump, and Mike's like, pick pick me up. And I was like, don't put me down. I was like, tell Scarlett my knee hurts. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, bad? I was like, bad. <laughs> So they put me down. I do the I do the ESPN thing, and I they're like, "You need bothering you?" I was like, "Oh no, not at all." <laughs> we go around back, and uh, our trainer, Chris Carlotta, does does the ACL check. I didn't know that's what he was doing, and like puts my leg down. He gives me this look, and I'm like, "Whatever you just found out, don't tell me." And he's like, "Oh yeah, well, you just tore your meniscus back." I'm like, "All right, perfect. That's all I needed to know." <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I was like, "I don't want to know. Don't tell me. I'm just gonna ignore that." And, uh, you know, that was how the whole tournament went. He's like, you know, we're going to tape your knee up before the semi. Just make sure you feel good. Could like, you, yeah. like, walk around, though, still, or no? No, so this is a funny story. So he taught me how to walk without my knee buckling every time just so that people wouldn't notice. So he's like, when you take a step, he's like, just have the slightest bend in your knee before you step. And I was like, okay. So I would walk, and I, all weekend, if you find me walking around, I'm kind of walking with my knees bent a little bit. <laughs> just so that... You know, my knee's not like, and then when I put the tape on, I could walk normal again because then the tape kind of held me up. And that was kind of how I went about it. You know, I had sweatpants on all weekends. You couldn't tell my knee was swollen and and I would ice it, you know, the whole time I was at the hotel. And, you know, even my semis match, it wasn't bad because I had all this like adrenaline going and I had wrestled and cut weight that day and warmed up and I was all, I feel like I was just warm, you know, through that day. And then. Saturday morning for the finals was when I woke up and I was like, "Oh, this is gonna be a problem for sure." <laughs> yeah, because it sits you know, overnight. I, you're pretty tight, and man, that had yeah. to had to be a little scary. Yeah, I remember I uh, shared a hotel room with Chaz Tucker, our 33 pounder, and I was like, "Chaz, can you help me get out of bed?" <laughs> <laughs> and did you already have your weight down, or did you still have to cut weight that morning? I, my weight was all right. You know, I took care of it the night before, kind of because. We thought that might happen. Mike yeah. was like, hey, just make sure you get all your weight off tonight. And in hindsight, maybe that was why. Maybe it was just for a different reason. But good good, good call by Mike having me get it all off the night before. You know, I go away in, and around 1 or 2 o'clock, you know, I've, I think everyone does it. You know, you go and do a workout just to open your lungs up. And I remember jogging was pretty tough. I couldn't take a shot. And it ended up being we just did this thing where we just – stood and pummeled and I hit arm drags and like high duck unders and throw bys and stuff just to like get hot and then I am just doing bike sprints to open my lungs up 
And still, I'm really good at lying, apparently. I was like, oh, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'll loosen out. Not a big deal. I'm not worried about it. And, uh, you know, same thing. Take my knee up and just kind of figure it out, make it work. And then I remember coming off, you know, off of um, off the mat. And we go around back and Coach Cole brings me up to this booth. You know, we have a lot of our big Earl alumni up there. And my dad is up there with him. And he's like, all right, go say hi to your dad. And on the way to saying hi to my dad, you know, I'm running into these other guys who are here in the Cornell section. And they're like, man, you know, I can't believe you did that. And I think they're talking about Cradle at the end. Like, oh, that was crazy. I can't believe you did that. You know, Wait, is being this injured after the win? This is after I won the tournament. They're like, I can't believe you're doing this being injured. You know, oh, like, how's your knee? I'm like, oh, my knee's fine. Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> and one of the ones who I'm a little bit closer with was like, hey, you know, it's pretty crazy you did that with a torn ACL. And I was like, I'm looking back at Coach Cole, like, is there something I'm missing? And he was just like nodding at me. And we'll go in and like give my dad a hug. I go down because my mom was closer to the front of the bleacher or the, the the section. Give my mom a hug and I'm like hugging her. I'm like, oh, I might have torn my ACL. And she was like, What? Like She yeah. didn't know. So Cole told no. all like the Cole told Cole your pops told, like, and all the high dad, dollar rollers. Cole Cole had told pretty much my dad and just the guys who were directly around him. But my mom was pregnant and already like freaking out. So he was like, maybe I'll wait. (laughs) You know, and so we just kind of, you know, and I definitely did not want to know. So we just let left me in the dark, you know, and kind of just trusted my dad wasn't going to say anything. And that was it. Well, dude, you're a guy where I remember – watching your press conference in 2018 probably like 15 times just because you talk about your self-belief a lot and I was like god this kid's this kid's got it man and I wanted to ask you knowing that you had that warm-up on Saturday at one or two o'clock in the afternoon you couldn't even take a shot did any self-doubt slip in there or were you still just laser focused honestly no there was no doubt which is just me lying to myself but I guess the for me, it was like, you're not going to not win. You know I mean? There's no, like in my brain, there was no way I was going to lose. And I, it sounds really arrogant when I say that, but it was just kind of like, I, I was just like, I'm not losing to anybody. So who cares if you're hurt? A big thing that Mike used to talk to me about was if you're hurt, you're sick, you know, you don't feel great. Whatever it is, you're just having a bad day. Like this is your reality. So deal with it. And that was kind of how it was. It was like, all right, the plan was to win. And I believed no one was going to beat me. I got hurt, but that's still what you think about yourself. You know, I mean, you're the same guy. Right. Nothing changed about you. You're just hurt now. And all I had was a torn meniscus, which helped. Which I'm, I'm gonna be honest, that helps. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because you're just like, ah, it's nothing. So I mean, maybe you know, subconsciously, I was like, this is gonna be tr- tough for me, but I still expected to win. You know, because I remember Mike sat me down. We had this talk, and he was like, listen. I get that you're hurt and you know you don't feel great, but in the end, you take second, you take second. There's no asterisk like, oh, well, he beat him during the year and got hurt in the tournament. Like, no. You know what I mean? So, right, right. Take, he's like, take that for however you want to take it. And he, you know, he knew what that meant. He knew what it meant to me. He kind of reminds me of what Customato used to tell Mike Tyson. He's like, you do not exist, only the task exists. Like, you, the task needs to be completed. Whatever state you're in, whether you want to do it, whether you don't want to do it, whether you're injured, whether you're not, it still needs to be completed, so get it done. Exactly. Right. Dude, now, I got to say, there was a match I was watching where as much belief as I have in Yanni D, I thought there was no way you could pull this off. Musa Kaev, Yasser Dogu, <laughs> how quick is that guy's reshot? Is that the most explosive reshot you've ever wrestled? He's the most powerful guy in my size I've ever wrestled. Unbelievable. By a million. I'm watching this like, match. I can't even see it. And a lot of time, it, like guys, like a lot of guys are fast, but they don't hit you. He hits you. Like I'm, I can get my legs back a little bit at least, or at least like settle my feet yeah. most of the time. If he touched my legs, he was slamming me on my head. Like I could not <laughs> get my feet settled for the life of me. Oh my! I was like, god. oh my god. He was I remember, so fast and strong too. Like you said, he looked like like an. Obviously, he's an adult, but like when he would hit, it was it was lights out, dude. But. Man. Yeah, he would he would get on his little hand and feet crawl and get all loaded up and and I was like, dude, you're really gonna <laughs> wow. I remember 
putting the heat on him a lot. And we we understood he was like that. Going into the match, you know, talking to Mike and my dad, actually, and Coach Zadik, and we were like, all right, this guy's going to get tired. But he's really good when he's good. So just make sure you're ready for that first period. I'm like, okay. Clearly, I wasn't ready. But I'm putting the heat on him for the first, you know, minute, 15, minute, 30. I'm like, attack, fake, snap, running into him, almost pushing him out. And they put him on the clock, and I'm like, all right, let's see what he's got. And I'm ready. I'm ready. I was ready for him to shoot to my leg and still right through me. I was like, wow. All right, there it is. Dude, for the folks who haven't watched this match, it's on YouTube. It's at the Yasser Dogu 2019 in the semis. At one point, down 9-0, and there was a little push out on the edge where it might even have been 10-0, but luckily, you guys, they called it no I push. I like twisted on my knees, and they were like, nothing, and I was like, oh, my God. And I'm <laughs> I'm like, man, did I miss this? But then slowly but surely, you start coming back, and I've never seen a man break like that. I mean, the, at one point, he was laying on his back. They gave him two passivities, and then he stalled him out of the match. I mean... How is that possible for a wrestler to be that good, but just that unable to push through it? I mean, it's tough for you to answer because you're not him, but, I mean, have you ever been in a position like that where you're feeling any type of heat like he was obviously feeling there? I mean, I've definitely been really tired, you know, but not like that. I think, you know, maybe he doesn't have a great training situation. And I also think he's he's pretty short, and he's got tons. Of big muscles, you know. What I mean, and yeah. when he goes, he does go really hard, and I think it takes a lot out of him. You know? Yeah, and that's kind of been his trend. You know, he, when he he doesn't do a lot when he goes, he goes so hard. It's like the most powerful and fast, explosive thing ever. And then he's got to like charge back up. And if you don't give him that opportunity to charge back up, I think he just gets really tired. You know, but he's. He's dangerous because when he goes, he's really hard to stop. <laughs> dangerous. That last scramble where you turned the tide, I thought it was over. Not over in the sense of the match being over, but I thought the takedown was over. You scramble out. You throw him in that cradle, the same cradle you caught. Um, um, Meredith. Yeah, Meredith. Then. Yeah, and then that was pretty much it at that point. It was a steamroll, dude. I was trying to think you of the guy who was it. yelling in the audience. Was that your dad? It was Bill. Okay. Zaddy. So I had uh, Mike and Zeph Buxton in my corner, and Bill, I I don't I don't know where he was, but I remember seeing him. It was like he had coached someone on the mat next to me and mm-hmm. was like taking the long way back so he could kind of like watch the end of this match. Mm-hmm. I could hear him a little bit, but he was yelling. My dad doesn't say a ton if he's not in the corner, just because he's like, <laughs> no, you know. <laughs> Right. Especially when I'm getting my head kicked in and it's 9 0. He's like, oh. Dude, that that was that was incredible. One of my favorite matches to watch. I mean, all of your matches are, are super fun. The Baj Ring match, also awesome. Um, you know, kind of hard to follow the scoring, but the, the match result was right. But, um, you know, I, I know we're winding down here. One of the things I wanted to talk about was I mean, pretty much it's been a highlight reel for most of your career um, in terms of the end of the year you've won. I was thinking about this as I was walking yesterday. You've won end of the year tournaments pretty much every year since seventh grade. Um, even last year when you won the Nationals, Final X versus Zane didn't go your way. And I've heard you say that it took you a while to get back on the horse after that. Um, talk us through that in terms of what was the conversation you and your dad had and how long was it after the match until you were able to start kind of getting going again because obviously that was a, a big disappointment for you and for a lot of the, the usa wrestling fans yeah i mean you know i, I didn't take that one super great it, it wasn't like i was upset you know about the whole the whole controversy of it i i was kind of disappointed in myself you know it's just one of those things i guess with myself is like i should never lose to someone who i've beaten before you know i mean so that that i was i was frustrated and disappointed in myself and uh you know it took me five days, four days. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I, I just, I was trying to just look at myself, I guess, and think about what everything I did wrong. You know, going back to December of, of 2018, you know, was there something I didn't do that I could have done? And, you know, I was, I was down, you know, Mike was helping me, you know, talking to me about it, like, hey, you gotta let it go, we're focused on these things. And, um, you know, my dad and my Mike, or my dad and Mike in the same day kind of had the same conversation with me. And I don't know if they both came up with it on their own or they talked to each other and then both just said it to me. But I remember, you know, I was at practice and I had finished and my dad called me and was like, Hey, so my dad's very philosophical. He was telling me a story about this Mike, this monk 
who was protesting, I think it might have been the Vietnam War. And he had sat in the street in protest of the Vietnam War, and he, this is crazy, but he set himself on fire. Right. Didn't scream, didn't move, just sat there. And the point of it was he didn't care who saw, you know, his, no one knows his name. He's just this monk. He didn't make a scene so that everyone could see him. All he did was, I guess, what he needed to do to make it aware, make it known, because that was his goal. And my dad's point was, you shouldn't do these things because you want accolades. And he's like, you shouldn't, you shouldn't be wrestling at the senior level because you want to be a world champ. He's like, you should do it because you want to be great at wrestling. You know what I mean? You just, you just want it. You know what I mean? That you shouldn't. You shouldn't live and die by the gold medal. It's what you want, and it's why you're doing it secretly. But you're wrestling because you want this higher level of greatness, and it's part of who you are. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And you know, later that day, Mike had pretty much said the, same, said the same thing to me, where he was like, "Listen, you know, you can't you can't live and die by the results. You got to live and die by how you wrestled." And he's like, "You can be disappointed that you wrestled that, but we both know that's not why you're upset." You know what I mean? And like that, like you know, between the, what my dad had said and what Mike had said, you know, that really resonated with me. Dude, I love how your and dad I, used that example like that. That's that's pretty unique to do that. Yeah, my dad's very philosophical, and he likes to he likes to make comparisons to other things. You know, it's kind of his way of being like, you're not the only one doing this. You know, you're not not to say that you're not special, but you're not special. You know, everyone everyone deals with stuff like this. So you know, I, that was really insightful and. You know, that, that helped me a lot because not only did it, it, it just changed me. I think, yes, you know, I, I matured from that. You know, I, I understood, you know, kind of what he meant. And I think I've lost track of, you know, why I do it a little bit. You but I also I mean? think so it I, was such a shock to you personally. Like, you, like, as we've heard from this conversation, and if anyone knows you, there's no doubt in your mind that you're going to get it done. So it's probably just a huge shock to you more than anything. Yeah, yeah I mean, you know, not to sound, you know, whatever, but I hadn't, I hadn't lost in a little over a year. And I had won a lot of these matches where I was pulling stuff out, you know, and finding a way to do it at the last second. Not that I was banking on that, but this time I was winning with short time, and I'm like, there's no way I'm losing. If I believe I'm not losing. And I, I found a way to lose. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I think I grew because of that, though, because it was another, it was a reset. You know, I mean, it was, it grounded me. And especially, you know, talking to that with my dad and talking to that with Mike, you know, it gave me a, this new perspective that I needed. I, uh, I'm glad we talked about it because the way your dad approached it is pretty cool. And th- this guy seems like a, like a, a monk in himself, man. Like, I don't even know what his day job is or how he got into all this, but man, I, I got to have him on the show just to, just to get his take on all this. Cause he's like a master motivator. It seems like. Yeah. I mean, so my dad is very philosophical and uh, his, he's got a, a very unique approach to just kind of life as a whole, because it's all very um, like his goal for us was kind of for me and my brothers was to kind of be undeterred by the world. You know what I mean? Whatever's going on, you have peace within yourself and it's not really a big deal. You know, things happen. My dad was like, he used to say this to us a lot. He's like, you know, I want to make sure like if I drop dead tomorrow, you guys are going to be okay. So that was kind of, you know, his approach to it. And, you know, he did a lot of philosophical stuff with us. And my mom did a lot more of the day-to-day, like, oh, how was school? How was this? How was that? Stuff with us, you know. My dad was very, he was very um, big picture guy. What's his day you know, job? Yeah, he, uh, he does wholesale seafood. Okay. So Sales guy. So, I like uh, it. Yeah, so he was, um, he is from Greece. And he moved to America when he was five years old maybe six with his parents obviously and uh his dad my grandpa started this wholesale seafood business and you know it, it was doing well and then my dad had taken over and there was a period of time you know where you know it was doing fine and then you know they got to deal with Wegmans to do all of their wholesale or um fresh fish they do the salmon burgers they do clams casino you know, Wegmans or you know around the northeast at least to a handful of locations you know, they do some packaging, they do some cat food because it's made from fish bones, you know, all this stuff. They're working on dog treats and it, it kind of like that, you know, and, you know, he made it work and 
he makes a joke all the time that he doesn't work because he's got it set up now where it's a little bit self-running where he pretty much says go and everyone goes and everyone knows what they what they need to do and he lives off the phone you know i mean he's making calls to wegmans making calls to fishermen getting fish so there's a kind of not that he has downtime but there's a lot of time where you're sitting waiting for the next phone call and he was like you know i might as well watch wrestling he watches and watches wrestling and then he'll you know, he goes back and forth. I make the joke between watching wrestling and reading Sun Tzu. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, watched a ton of film and got he's really into philosophy. So he kept reading about that stuff and, you know, took a, took a little bit of each and stuffed it into, you know, me and my two brothers. God, that's awesome. So he is he like one of those guys like 5 a.m. every day up and going, just grinding all day? He, um, I'll say he doesn't sleep a lot, but... Here's an example of something that my dad's done. My dad might go to bed at nine, wake up at one in the morning and watch the entire NCAA finals, think about five things I need to work on and then go back to bed and wake up at, you know, 8 a.m. and come knock on my door at 8.30 and be like, hey, you got to do this. And like, we'll talk about it for an hour or whatever. (laughs) I can't think of how many times there were mornings where, you know, Vito Arruzzo was at my house when we were in high school. And and Vogar would come over and, you know, him and my dad would be up talking, 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 talking. And I'm like, dude, there's no way we're gonna wrestle, you know, super early in the morning. Like I know it, because they're gonna be they're gonna be up later than we are. You know, we go to bed at eleven, eight o'clock rolls around, and you're like, what? And my dad's like, hey, we figured out all these things you guys need to work on, and we ended up just doing technique for two hours, working on stuff, and you know that was kind of how how it went growing up. You know, it was always looking for the next thing. I didn't realize that Vito's dad was a world champ. Yeah, his dad was amazing. Two-time world champ, Olympic bronze medalist for the Soviet Union. I think he had a silver or bronze medal in the world, too. He was really successful for them. Freestyle? Freestyle guy. He wrestled tiny weight, like 48 or 52 kilos. It's so like after the Bell Glazov or before the Bell Glazovs? I want to say a little after. He wrestled, I think his first gold medal was in 91. Okay, okay, so after then, okay. So a little after. Okay. And uh, it's funny because, like, talking about holding yourself to high standards, if you ask him about it now, he's still really disappointed that he never won. I think it was 92 or 96 that he didn't win, but he's still he's really disappointed about it. And, you know, he, that's another one, like, Vogar talks to, you know, Vito and I about it, or me and Vito about it. You know, he's like, you guys need to – there's going to be a certain level of things you want to accomplish and you guys need to stay disciplined to do it. And he's like, trust me, things that you might enjoy now or you might think are worth missing out on other stuff. He's like, they're not. Because when you're 40, you're going to be upset that you didn't do what you wanted to do. And, you know, that's one of those things that always hit home with me too. You know what I mean? It's, you, you, you can't have immediate gratification if you want to achieve great things. I think the biggest takeaway for me, though, from this conversation, and we'll wrap up here, is you have an ability to do that, but also not feel like you need to work out twice a day. Or, or you know, like you, it's not that you're doing more; it's that you're doing more in the time you put into it. Like you're not just going like six hours a day every day because that's not good on the body, right? You're able to focus it on a specific period of time, two hours, and then use the rest of your day to think about it philosophically or. Or work out some positions in your head, whereas some people, including myself, feel like you would need to go like twelve hours a day to get that done. So you have a a good confidence in yourself that you don't have to do that. Yeah, I mean, I try to be optimal with my time. Yeah, you know what I mean, because wrestling is one of those things that you can't do all day. It's not like um like they used to say Michael Phelps would spend six or eight hours in the pool. Like we can't do that. So we have to be really optimal with our time, which includes you know planning ahead and reflecting after and you know just being being smart about it and i think that was one of those things that you know kind of got hammered home with me growing up and you know don't get me wrong i'm i'm all for doing the extra i believe doing the extra is what gets you there right but you can't have wasted you can't spend 30 minutes of the workout just figuring out what you want to do like every moment that you're doing something needs to be towards a goal Right. So that's kind of my focus. Purposeful. I love it. Well, we'll let you go, man. My last question always is, how did wrestling change your life? Obviously, you're a, a young guy. Life hasn't even started yet for you, really. And 
you know, you, you're still going to see where the sport takes you. But just in your uh, your short time here, how long? I mean, what's the biggest takeaway you have from the sport, even though it is your life, obviously? I mean, it 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 created me. You know, my best friends, my best friends wrestle. You know, my it's it's part of my family. You know, it's just my life wouldn't even it wouldn't be the same. I will. I I can say that to a T. There's not a single person who is in my life now or who I care about now other than, you know, my family, obviously, that would I would be I would I might not even know who they are if not for wrestling. You know what I mean? And you know, some of my, my best friends are all people who I grew up with wrestling with. You know, it's kinda of that bonding through mutual suffering and you know, it got me to Cornell. It got me it just got me, you know, even just talking about, you know, for myself, like self confidence. Just like Help me mature, you know, turn into a the person I am. It just, uh, it's everything for me. You know, I mean, if it wasn't for wrestling, I'd probably be some, you know, I don't even know. You don't know. <laughs> you don't know. You know, I mean, it's just, it started at such a young age, but, you know, I can guarantee my life wouldn't have been better any other way except, you know, wrestling when I was five years old. That's a fact, man. I mean, think about all the traveling you've done, all the things you get to experience, and it's just getting started. I mean, to me, I, for someone like you, I was almost excited that the Olympics got postponed because we're going to see a better version of you next year. Um, yeah, so, man. you know what I mean? It's like, of all the people, I'm like, yeah, probably didn't hurt Yanni as bad as it did a, a JB, you know? So, um, yeah. well, we're excited to watch you in the future, man. Uh, you have a ton of fans here in Chicago. Everyone I know loves watching you wrestle, so I appreciate you taking some time today, brother. We'll talk to you soon. Yeah, thank you for having me on. Absolutely. And all great things must come to an end. If you want to hear more from the podcast, text WRESTLE to 555-888. That's WRESTLE to 555-888. You can also find us on Instagram, Wrestling Changed My Life, Twitter, Ryan underscore N underscore Warner, as well as our website, WrestlingChangedMyLife.com. Take care, y'all. Calm. Take care, y'all. Calm. Take care, y'all. Calm. Take care, y'all. Calm. Take care, y'all. Calm.